So this is the sixth film in the uh, Rethinking Existentialism series. And in this film, we're going to think about uh, one of Jean-Paul Sartre's most famous works of fiction, uh, his play, Huey Clo, um, which is usually translated into English as uh, either No Exit or No Way Out, or as In Camera. Um, this, that second one, In Camera, by the way, is the more literal translation. So uh, Huey Clo uh, is a French legal phrase, uh, and it means um, proceedings that are happening behind closed doors, so without a public gallery or a press gallery. Um, and, the, and the English phrase for, for um, similar kind of proceedings is in camera. Um, but it's less often used as the title, I think, probably because it is legal jargon, and so it's um, not entirely obvious or clear to most people what it means. Uh, I think it's the better title. I think it's better than the title No Exit uh, for reasons that I'm going to explain in this film. So what I'm going to do in this film is I'm going to first I'm going to explain the standard reading of the play. I mean there are lots of uh, ways in which uh, people who read the play and perform in the play and produce the play disagree over you know, details of the play. But I think there's a there's a kind of standard understanding of what's going on in the play. Um, and I think that standard understanding is mistaken. And it's mistaken in an interesting way, not just for, for the play itself as a dramatic production, which it is interesting for that, but also for understanding um, Sartre's philosophy, Sartre's existentialism uh, of the early 1940s. So he wrote the play in 1944. Uh, very quickly, uh, after three of his friends, uh, you know, one of whom was Camus, uh, asked uh, for a play for them to perform in. Um, there are three main characters in the play. They're all uh, given, I think, roughly equal number of lines. Um, no one of them ever leaves the stage. They come on one at a time at the beginning, um, and then they're all still there at the end. Um, that, I think, is part of the appeal of the, of the name No Exit. Um, Nobody exits uh, the stage. That's not quite true because there's also a butler um, and he does come and go a bit at the beginning, but then he's out of it and he's only really there to introduce the characters, um, the, the main characters. So Sartre wrote this, as I say, in 1944. Um, he, his three friends who it was originally written for never uh, acted in it. I believe Camus never played the part of Garcin, um, the, the uh, male character. Uh, but the play went on to be quite a success, um, and after the war, it was staged many times in in Paris and then much much wider across the Western world in in uh, in various languages, uh, and very quickly established um, Sartre as a as a major kind of figure in in the th in theatre uh, at the time. The standard reading of it. Uh, focuses on a, on a, on a line that uh, comes out of Garcin's mouth uh, almost at the end when he declares that hell is other people. Uh, and that phrase, hell is other people, is um, probably one of the most quoted phrases of the whole of Western philosophy. You, you hear it a lot, uh, parodied and uh, recycled and printed on T-shirts and so on and so forth. Um, people tend to take it that that's the message of the play, that that is the key line of the play, right? That um, these characters are all stuck together in this room and what they begin to discover is that hell is other people. Um, so on the standard reading, what's going on is that all three of them are literally in hell. They're in hell, they've died, they've uh, been sent to hell for their uh, sins while they were alive and they have been carefully chosen to spend eternity in a room together because uh, that way they will all be tortured for all eternity because they simply can't get on with each other. Right? And uh, in particular, that each of them wants to establish a, or a particular identity for themselves. They want to understand themselves as being a particular kind of person. In fact, they always did. And the other two in the room don't see them that way. So they see them as a different kind of person. Garson um, wants to see himself as a kind of macho hero, um, but the other two really think actually he's a bit of a coward. Right? 
and supposedly, on a standard reading, all three characters are, are locked into that kind of a problem, that their most fundamental understanding of themselves and image of themselves is perennially challenged and undermined by the views that these other two people have of them, and that's the hell that they're now locked into. Um, that's another reason why people like the phrase no exit as a title, right? Because they they read the play as uh, as um, as the characters themselves uh, claim themselves to be in hell um, and and to have no way of getting out. Um, so when it's read in this way, it's read as a kind of morality tale. It's read as um, as declaring not necessarily that hell is other people, that other people are hell, um, but rather that other people are hell only if you have a particular kind of attitude towards yourself. That is, that you're particularly concerned with the way other people see you, with establishing a particular kind of identity or a particular kind of image. And then, according to this reading of the play, the, uh, the problem you face is that you can never really establish that kind of image. Other people will always see you through the lens of their own projects. They will always understand your behaviour in their own way. And as a result, they will always have images of you which are different from your own um, and different from the one that you're trying to establish. And that that supposedly is a kind of existential hell. But um, on the optimistic side, uh, we don't need to worry too much about what other people think of ourselves and instead uh, on this reading of the play, Sartre's message is that we should just get on and define ourselves through our actions and our projects and the things that we do and the things that we achieve and the relationships that we form. And that is who we really are, irrespective of any image we have of ourselves or other people have of us. Um, and that the difference between us and the characters in the play is that we're still alive. We can still do that and we can still continue to um, uh, just pursue our own projects and become the people that we are becoming, whereas they are uh, unable to change, unable to do anything uh, because they're dead. And so they are now locked into this uh, hell of, uh, of trying to establish their own preferred image of themselves and being challenged in that by uh, the other two. So as I say, that's the standard reading, and I don't agree with it. Um, I think it's mistaken on lots of lots of counts, actually. Um, so I detail these uh, in uh, in my chapter, um, chapter six of the book that I'm writing, um, which is called what's it called? It's called Why Inez is Not in Hell. That's the name of the chapter. Um, and the reason it's called that is that I think one of um, one of the central problems with the standard reading is that Inez, one of the three main characters, uh, she doesn't face the same problem that the other two seem to face. She doesn't face the problem that her own preferred self-image is being challenged by the people that she's spending uh, this time with in, locked in this room. Right? Um, she declares herself to be uh, uncommonly nasty. She declares herself to be somebody who just is uh, deeply... Um, fundamentally cruel and just likes to torture people and make them unhappy and and um, neither of the other two really disagree with that. I think we can all agree as we watch Inez uh, continue to uh, uh, get under the skin of the other two that yeah she is uncommonly nasty, she is cruel, she is trying hard uh, to torture them even as she declares that actually they're all locked in this room to torture one another. It's it's obvious that she's actually primarily doing the doing the torturing. So she doesn't have the problem that other people don't affirm her self-image. Actually, um, everybody agrees she's just fundamentally cruel. Um, I think for this reason, um, Inez is not like the other two. I think it's not just that she doesn't face the same problem that they face. I think that um, she's just not one of us at all, right? So um, part of the problem that the other two face is that they're trying to uh, establish that they have a particular image or establish a particular image of themselves, a particular identity, as though it were a kind of fixed nature, an essence, 
that defines them and defines their action and causes their behaviour. Right? And that's why they find other people's views of them challenging. So Garson um, wants to think of himself as essentially macho. Right? He just is a kind of embodiment of machismo. And that's why it's so threatening to him when people see any of his actions as being cowardly. Because if he was essentially macho, essentially brave and tough and strong, then um, he wouldn't ever do cowardly things. So one or two cowardly actions stand as, as counterexamples to his self-image. Um, I think that Estelle has a very similar problem, although for her it's uh, not uh, the stereotype of masculinity that she wants to identify with, it's a social stereotype of femininity that she wants to identify with. And she wants to see herself as essentially feminine, as by nature feminine, as the surrounding culture understands that. Um, and then she has a similar problem that uh, other people don't necessarily uh, confirm her self-image. Uh, Inez, as I say, everyone else does confirm her self-image. And I think there's good reason for this. I think that um, uh, we can read her as actually genuinely possessing an essence, as, as having an, a fixed nature, as being essentially cruel, essentially exactly what she said she is, nothing more than uh, a, a creature who is by nature uh, 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 trying to torture other people. That is, I, I think Inez is not one of us. She's not a mortal. She's not a human. Um, she is... As I put it in the chapter, she's an insider. She's a demon right, in hell, if this is hell. And her job is to torture the other two. Right? The reason why um, the play is usually read as the three of them torturing one another is because that's the conclusion that those three characters come to. That's, that's what they decide is going on. But um, they only come to that conclusion because Inez tells them that's what's going on. She declares that they've been put together to torture one another and that that's why there are no torture instruments and no demons there and in the end the other two come to believe it quite oddly i mean quite funnily i think garson um when he comes to believe it he doesn't he doesn't um recognize really that inez has already told him to believe this he kind of bring he, he kind of comes to this conclusion as though it's his own discovery that's when he declares hell is other people i mean he just says that as though he's just worked it all out for himself, even though quite clearly in the play, Inez has been saying it all along. Uh, Inez has been planting that idea in people's heads, and I think she's been doing it as part of her role as the demon. Right? It makes much more sense uh, it, it, she, for those other two to think that they're just torturing one another. If they realise that her job is to torture them and to, and to, and to goad them, then um, uh, they would find it easier to resist her and stop listening to her, I think. So I think that there's a kind of um, uh, deception going on within the play, uh, among the characters, and that is what hoodwinks the audience a little as well into believing, as the characters, as Estelle and Garcin certainly end up believing, uh, that, they are, that these characters are in hell and torturing one another. Um, I think, however, they're not in hell. It's not strictly uh, true to say that they're in hell. And this is why I think that In Camera is a better title than No Exit. Um, I think where they are is at the Last Judgment. Okay, they're, they're undergoing a kind of legal proceeding rather than undergoing the punishment. Um, and if they were in hell and locked in for all eternity, then there would be no exit. But they're not. They're on trial. And there will be an exit. The only question is which direction they will be moving in when they exit. And I say that because I think that what's going on... So, so if that's right, Inez is not simply a torturer. She is, I think, um, the counsel for the prosecution. Right? She is... Her aim is to bring Garson and Estelle to understand what their sins are. Okay? And to bring the audience to understand what Garson and Estelle's sins are. Right? Because I think we, the audience, when we watch the play, we're the judges. 
we're inside the room, we're, in, we're, we're inside the logic of the play. We're not simply spectators, because there are no spectators, right? Because there is no public gallery, and there is no press gallery, because these are proceedings ui clo in camera. So we must be inside the closed room um, as part of the proceedings. But our, jo our job is to keep quiet, watch, and form a judgment of those characters, which is, of course, what we do. It's what you naturally do uh, when you're the audience of a play. Garcin makes some progress across the play. He begins to understand, I think, what his crime, what his sin is. And I think that Estelle, the other mortal um, who is on my reading, facing last judgment, makes no progress at all. She just goes round and round in circles, asserting her femininity. Whereas Garcin begins to understand, at least, that some of his actions are at least ambiguous, that they can be read in more than one way. And I think that is um, the first step towards his understanding that he doesn't have a fixed nature of any kind, a, a fixed essence of any kind, that actually it's only his actions that define him. And I think that that's uh, ultimately what the, the, the setup is designed to elicit, that it's designed to bring both Garcin and Estelle to understand that their fundamental sin is what Sartre calls bad faith, that is identifying themselves uh, with a particular essence or a particular nature, which they then claim just causes their behaviour. Right? Um, it's because they see themselves in that way, though they differ in exactly what way, Garson sees himself as essentially masculine in a stereotypical way, uh, Estelle sees herself as essentially feminine in a stereotypical way, but because they see themselves as having these fixed essences, that's what causes all of their trouble. And the aim of the proceeding, I say, is to bring them to understand that, to bring them to confess their sins in front of us, the audience. So if that's right, the key line in the whole thing is not Garson's claim uh, that hell is other people at all. Um, rather, other people are only hell for him and for Estelle because they commit this sin of bad faith, because they see themselves as having a particular fixed nature. And then their view of themselves is always going to be challenged by other people's views of their actions. But if they didn't see themselves as having a fixed nature in the first place, then the fact that other people can read their actions in different ways wouldn't be a challenge to their self-image. Okay, So it's not that, hell, that other people are essentially hell or necessarily hell, it's that other people are hell if, like Garcin and Estelle, you're living your life through the project of bad faith. The line of the play that really um, summarises Sartre's philosophy is a line that appears in Inez's mouth. Inez declares at one point when she's challenging Garcin to, um, to come to recognise his sins, um, she says, you are your life you're, and nothing else. That is, you are what you do and what you've achieved and, and the people you've lived with. Um, and, and that is all you are. There, there's no fixed core no essence, no nature uh, uh, that stays constant and causes your behaviour. You are nothing but what you've done. That's Sartre's view. Um, and as I say, it's Inez, not Garcin, who recognises that throughout the play. And her aim, I think, is to bring the other two to recognise it as well. Right, so that's my view of Sartre's play, Louis Clo. Um, it's, uh, I think, an important dramatisation of Sartre's uh, view at that stage of his career that um, uh, bad faith, which he thinks is a, a pervasive uh, uh, social phenomenon, um, is at the core of our difficulties in personal and social relations, um, in, the, in our difficulties uh, that we face in organising our lives the way we want to and getting on fine with one another. Um, and in the next film, I'm going to talk a bit more about his reliance on bad faith in order to understand um, social 
relations and in order to ground his cultural theory uh, and I'm going to argue there that um, it's a weakness of his position and it's a great strength of Simone de Beauvoir's position that she can rely on sedimentation to do that work instead.